Today, we're going to talk photos with fun, which has kind of a different meaning to it. Plus, I've got a special announcement for you on this episode of Behind the Shot. Hi, welcome to another show of uh, Behind the Shot, the show where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots from conception to completion and all the stories and challenges that happen in between. I'm your host, as always, Steve Brazel. And today we've got a couple of interesting things happening before we get into the actual show with my guest. Just a reminder, we do have a YouTube channel. It's Behind the Shot on YouTube. Of course, you can also follow us on Instagram or Twitter at Behind the Shot TV. And it's Behind the Shot Podcast on Facebook. Make sure that you follow us everywhere, subscribe everywhere, and that way you'll get what you need. And one last thing is if you are a real podcast fan, grab yourself a podcast app. And whatever podcast app you choose, subscribe to the podcast there. We have an audio feed and a video feed. Be careful not to get the old one. The feed that you'll find will say my name, Steve Brazel, on it. Subscribe to it, and that way you'll get all the latest episodes delivered right to whatever your device is, and you'll always be up to date. So that brings us up to today's show. And for today's show, I'm going kind of a a unique direction because this guest today is not just a photographer, but he's one of the people that is teaching the up-and-coming photographers. I want to welcome Josh Sanseri to the show. Josh, how are you, man? I'm good. How are you? I'm really good, but I'm better than you are, I think, because you've had, <laughs> we might as well, can we, t- can we say what's happened? Sure. So sure. you've we were, had uh, kind uh, of a rough couple of weeks. Yeah, it's been pretty chaotic. It's been, it's been a little nuts around here. Um, we were evacuated with those big fires um, here um, last week. We were out of our house for about eight days, um, you know, with just the bare minimum, uh, hanging out with our friends on the other side of town. <clears throat> Um, you know, trying to will the fire away from the house. So, and fortunately it worked out for us, but um, yeah, we're back in the house as of Friday. So a couple of days ago. And one of the questions was going to be, cause it's kind of critical. Not only did you get back to the house, but you've had contractors working on your kitchen that now <laughs> needed to make up time. And you weren't sure that you were going to have internet, but for some reason we got lucky and everything has worked out. So to just so that I say it, my best to you and your family. And I'm glad that you're home and I'm glad that you're safe. And to everybody else out there suffering from the fires, I know a lot of people that, you know, were at risk of evacuation and we've lost lives, for example, in Northern California to everybody stay safe. And I hope everybody makes it through this, uh, these weird fire seasons. Well, so Josh, let's talk about you for a second. You are, I'm trying to figure out how to describe what you do photography wise. So I'm going to go with what's on your website. You're a portrait photographer. You are also a landscape photographer. You're a music photographer, but a lot of your music stuff is more towards the portrait end and promo shot stuff as well. And I mentioned that you're an educator and I want to start there because you are a professor at Santa Monica College's photography program. You're in fact, you're the department chair of, of that program. But not only Santa Monica College, which is a highly regarded photography program, a lot because of you, uh, but you've taught at UCLA, UCLA, uh, UCSD, Santa Fe workshops, which I get their emails and I keep telling myself I need to go <laughs> one day. Yeah. Uh, Art Center College of Design and a bunch of other things. Your background also, you do have a formal photography background. You've got a BA in cinema uh, and photography and MFA in art. And I mentioned music photography. You are the official photographer for the festival Outside Lands and Treasure Island uh, for both of those music festivals. So I'm kind of curious. With what you do, both on the photography end and the education end, and actually, let me mention, you've been published as well. Business Week, Rolling Stone, Billboard, LA Times Magazine, you've been around. With what you do on the photography education end, what is the state of music photography? You get the same question I get. Does it really help in today's day and age? Do people really need a formal photography education? Where are we at photography ed-wise? Well, I mean, there, I get that question all the time from my students, you know, and um, I went the formal way. Um, I'm a big fan of, of school. That's why I'm, you know, a teacher now. I, I, never, I, I loved college, so um, I never planned on leaving. But, um, you know, that, that path doesn't work for everybody. Um, you don't necessarily need the formal path. Um, there's plenty of success stories of people figuring it out on their own. Um, that being said, um, you know, the, um, 
college gives you a really unique uh, perspective and experience with photography. You're, 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 you're in a room with, you know, 30 to 40 other photographers that have a, a similar um, interest as you and skill level as you, and you're all excited and talking about photography, um, which will never happen again after school. It's, it's really, you know, unique to the educational experience to be in that situation. Um, so after school, you you have to beg people to look at your pictures. <laughs> well, yeah, to, to do a portfolio <laughs> review. It, it's interesting, right. too, because I know a lot of people who went the formal route. And I know, like you do, too, you know, people who didn't go the formal route. I didn't. But I think I'm different in the fact that I kind of wish that I had. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I wish that I had known then what I know now. I got into photography very late because I had a son that I wanted to photograph. And so I, I picked it up and I'm a network engineer by trade. So the geekiness of it worked for me. And I wish I had understood that photography was kind of a techie, geeky thing when I was young, because I, I probably would have gotten into it sooner. Education being what it is, there are still those issues with any education program of resources that are available to you. So we're going to be starting something, or I should say, I'm going to be starting something here on the podcast where once a quarter, I'm going to have somebody on from an educational program that is run by Red River Paper, which is a a paper company that does really nice high-end photo paper. And your program, the Santa Monica College Photography Program, is a partner of Red River Paper's EDU program. So I'm kind of curious, what does it mean to to photography education to have partnerships with industry people like Red River Paper for both you and your students? Uh, it's amazing. I mean, it. Um, we have a lot of um, a lot of uh, partnerships with um, with photo manufacturers. We, you know, we work with Canon quite a bit, um, Freestyle Photo, um, and now you know Red River, um, Pro Photo even. Um, but uh, it's it's great. It gives the students um, you know the resources to put their hands on uh, legitimate um, you know professional quality equipment and and have the experience you know while they're in school. Um, better preparing um, them for, you know, those uh, for, for the commercial world or the working world. Um, so um, and I mean, also financially, it's it's huge to have those student discounts or sometimes free, you know, like right. you know, Red River has been really good to us. And and, you know, when you're in college, you don't have a lot of money. So, you know, every little bit helps and um, it helps relieve the pressure so they can Um, you know, focus on making pictures. Well, and it's interesting too, because as I mentioned, I'm going to start this thing where once a quarter, one of the, I think it's six schools in the the Red River Paper uh, EDU program, yours being one, uh, once a quarter, I'm going to get either a professor slash instructor as one of my guests or a student from one of those programs, because I've been really impressed with what some students, I mean, I, I see student pictures that it's like, really, you're still in school? You know, you clearly have an eye. And right. when I was talking with the student that I'm going to have on, the first episode like that, the, the quote-unquote Red River Paper uh, EDU episode, is going to be my next episode. And we've picked the student, you and I. It's going to be one of your students. You want to share the name of the student that we're going to have on? Yeah, his name's Carl Eric, and he's been in our program for um, a couple years now. He's taken a good range of classes, and... Um, He's a hard worker. He has a unique uh, eye, I think, and um, he's really passionate about photography. So I think that was a really good, really good choice. Yeah. Uh, Car- Carl Eric, is it Voslog? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Sorry. And he's from Norway. And mm-hmm. if you watch the next episode, you'll learn a lot about Carl Eric. But when I talked to him preparing for the episode and I said to him, you know, you're familiar, obviously, with the Red River paper stuff. He said, yeah, I'm using it now. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it to me, it's kind of neat because it gets students to understand what a print is because nobody you know so many people don't print anymore and the argument can be made it's not a photo till it's printed so it's kind of neat that they get that that uh, what's tactile yeah kind of feedback tangible print yeah so that i mean that's in in all my classes and in a lot of the other professors classes you know in our in our departments you know that we we we're kind of we have that same philosophy that um it's not finished until it's printed until you can hold it and, um, it, you know, it's, you can hide a lot of things on a, you know, a two inch Instagram post that you can't hide oh, yeah. in a, in a print, you know? So, 
um, it really holds them accountable and um, trains them to be, you know, really looking at the details and and paying attention. OK, well, I, I'm looking forward. It, it was a great pick. The guy's got some. I mean, seriously, I, I looked at it and went, really? He's a student. He's way better than I am. Um, <laughs> so this is going to be a really interesting episode and the whole series that we're doing again once a quarter. There's also going to be a contest tied to it where we're going to give out some like 10 Red River paper sample packs. And then one of the people who get one of those sample packs is also going to win a 13 by 19 print of Carl Eric's photo. And it's a beautiful photo, the one we've got lined up for the next episode. So to, to the behind the shot fans out there, make sure that you watch for that. And of course, subscribe to the podcast. All the links are at our website, which is behindtheshot.tv. And that will make it a little easier for you to subscribe and get everything that, that you need out of it. So that kind of brings us to you as a photographer and kind of brings us full circle, right? I want to talk about this photo of yours. And before I do, I want to I want to just touch on something generic. Whenever I have a guest on, I I always approach it as what is. Yeah, there was a little Internet glitch that'll, you know, because, you know, Internet is what it is. Um, So if you (laughs) saw Josh Freeze, that's why Um, I always like to look through people's portfolios and kind of get a, a global sense, not an individual shot, but the themes and and commonalities that run through their photos. A lot of your portraits, a lot of the portraits that you do in your portfolios are musicians or entertainment people, Uh, or for that matter, you've got some politicians in there too. How do you get gigs like that? Well, um, you know, uh, it's, I can tell you how I got them. (laughs) I don't know how other people get them, but, um, the, the, all that kind of work started about 12 years ago. Um, it was a friend of mine who worked at uh, a promoter up in San Francisco, and um, she hired hired me to to photograph uh, their festivals. Um, and then it just kind of snowballed from there. Um, you know, once you start shooting that kind of work, it kind of you get more of that kind of work. And you know, um, the 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 old adage, you know, you you shoot what you want to shoot, right? So so if you want to shoot fashion, you need to shoot fashion. um, And then people will start noticing you as a fashion photographer. So, um, and that kind of worked out for me is in terms of being a music photographer. Yeah. And you've got some really cool music. I don't want to say music portraits because it's going to make it sound, you do music too, obviously with the festivals, but I don't want to say music portraits because they're really not music portraits, right? They're, they're portraits. They're almost environmental portraits. One of the ones we almost chose for the show was a shot I absolutely love of Tom Morello in his studio with the chair raised up high and the way the mixing board is in front of it, which which is a trend I noticed in your environmental portraits. There's actually two. One is that some of your environmental portraits, a good portion of them are quote unquote, they're not portraits like you think of a traditional portrait headshot like what we are on screen right now. They're environmental, they include some of the space around the person, But unlike a lot of environmental portraits, the environment isn't necessarily tied to the subject, right? So you've got Bill Nye, the science guy in the woods, right? Or or you've got Gavin Newsom, you know, out, out in nature. But a lot of your portraits, you have a sense of of depth where you shoot portraits almost like a landscape photographer. I don't know if you've noticed that, but if you look through your portfolio and people go look at his portfolio, uh, sanseri.com. If if you go look through your pictures more globally instead of individually, the Tom Morello one, you've got a foreground subject with the blurred mixer, right? You've got ones where a table is in front of people and it's blurred. And the shot we're going to talk about today is that way. I'm curious your use of strong foreground subjects in it, uh, is that something that you do intentionally? Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I, I can probably trace that back to graduate school when I was doing a lot of documentary environmental portraits in grad school and really studying, you know, how I wanted to, to see and how I wanted to photograph and how I wanted to, you know, communicate how I see. Um, so I was looking at a lot of architecture photography, a lot of nature photography, um, architectural digest, you know, that sort of thing. Um, the, the work of, of uh, Arnold Newman um, and just studying um, that type of photography and trying to figure out, okay, if this was, if this was where I'm shooting today, where does the person go in the scene? 
Um, so I, I spent okay. a lot of time. I, I, I apologize. I need to interrupt you on that no, one. Yeah. That was a conscious thought for you where you'd look at a non-person scene and wonder if I had a person where it would go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Go ahead and continue because that's I love that. That's fascinating. <laughs> And that's that's how I approach every every shoot that I ever do. I'm you know I look for the background first, and I'm um, scouting and hunting. You know sometimes I'm I'm pretty methodical about it, and sometimes uh, you know it could take a couple hours to find the shot. Sometimes it just clicks right away. But um, you know I try to find something that's um, that's simple and graphic um, and aesthetically pleasing. And um, if possible, you know, depending on the circumstances, I, I do like it to be a relevant background to the person. I like there to be some sort of um, correlation between, you know, where they're sitting and and who they are. But that's not always possible when you get two minutes with, you know, with a rock star backstage. It's, you know, you just have to make make it work right. the best you can. You have so, one. I, I keep I got to get to the image, but you have a lot of images that. I had a really hard time with you picking these images. You have one. I don't know who it is. You're, you actually use the grass as the foreground subject. And the one I'm thinking of, your camera is really low as though it's on a platypod. And a guy laying down mm. on a bench. And again, there's that spatial awareness, that depth um, that is absolutely amazing where the you're really close and you get a depth of field from the grass and the bench seems humongously out of proportion and yet realistically proportioned. Right. Um, just really, really, I, I really like where you go with those, which kind of brings us to uh, the image I want to talk about today. Now the shot, as I pull it up, this is, I mentioned at the beginning portraits with fun. Well, I mean that literally, this is the band fun who has had a number of hits let me know a little bit about this technically. So what are, what are we looking at here, camera and exposure wise? So it's a, it's a Canon 5D Mark II um, and a 16 to 35 millimeter zoom lens. I'm, I'm at 16, I'm all the way um, zoomed out to 16. Um, and I'm overpowering the sun with my light. So I'm at, I'm at a 125th of a second um, at F16. So. Um, okay, uh, that, that's an interesting one to me. So let's let's kind of attack that a little bit. First of all, 16 millimeters, a lot of people would say never shoot a portrait at 16 millimeters uh, because of distortion that you'll get to people. But they don't look that distorted. Right. So is that because you placed them, you you intentionally placed them in the middle? That's kind of how it ended up. But, you know, when I'm when I'm doing that kind of work, I'm not I'm not so concerned if it distorts them. I think sometimes the distortion, you know, adds visual interest. Um, not always, but sometimes it does. And um you know, when you're uh, again, when you're when you're in those backstage situations and you literally have 30 seconds with a band, you know, you're and you're trying to create something interesting. You kind of got to break some of those rules and and you can't shoot everything with an 85 millimeter lens and right, big soft right. light. You know, it, it's it just becomes generic. So um, that particular picture uh, was shot at Outside Lands Music Festival in San Francisco. And I've been their portrait photographer for 11 years now, I think. And um you know, I shoot 40 or 50 band portraits every year and the location's pretty much the same every year. So it's a, um, it's a, it's a real challenge for me to find something new for every picture because I don't want to make the same picture right. over and over again. So, um, every year it gets harder and harder to, to make new pictures. With, um, so the lens choice can, can help, you know, um, right. Yeah, so lens ahead. choice, you said you're overpowering yeah. the sun and you're using a flash here. Yeah. yeah. So, when I think overpowering the sun, I, I think immediately go to whatever my sync speed is, you know, 200th or yeah. 250th of a second. Uh, what it, you said this was a 5D2. So what's the sync speed? 200th of a second? Well, in the in the book, it says 200th. But realistically, with pocket wizards, it's it's around 125th. OK, so I was going to say, why did you do 125th instead of? OK, yeah. So what's your flash that you're using? Uh, that's an Ellen Chrome Ranger in that picture. Um, it's an 1100 watt second uh, battery system. Um, and I would, when I shoot those portraits at the festival, I, um, I have an assistant who um, helps me out and carries all the gear. And uh, cause we're running from stage to stage for three days straight. Um, it's about 20 miles of walking each day. Um, but uh, so he carries all the gear and we carry basically two modifiers. Um, so that one was lit with a 40 degree grid. Um, if you know what that is, it's like a, a honeycomb grid that goes in the, in the strobe reflector and kind of, I don't want to say focuses the light, but it, um, 
it concentrates the light. So right. it, it has dramatic fall off. Prevents and, spill uh, going sideways. Yeah, exactly. It concentrates the light and directs it in a, in, you know, wherever you want. So, so um, what was the, the flash was, what was it in? Was it in a, a dish, a, a Ellen Chrome dish of some sort, or was it an umbrella? You know, umbrella? Just a, no, it's a, it's a seven inch reflector with the, with the grid. Okay. So it's a pretty small light source. And then um, sometimes I'll shoot that with a big five foot octobank if, if I want to use soft light. So those are basically my two go-tos for those quick portraits. Okay. So uh, since we're into lighting here, let me, let yeah. me dive a little <laughs> deep into this. Sure. You, I mentioned earlier that you use strong foreground subjects, almost as though it's it's landscape. You know, landscape, it's foreground subject, midground subject, you know, background subject. Your foreground subject here is the fence. Were you worried about the highlights and flash on the fence? Or you don't no. care because the people clearly, the, the, the visual bodies clearly overpower the fence, plus you've got light fall off going down a, a leading line down the fence. Right. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not too concerned about, you know, I, I always take test shots to make sure the lighting is going to be okay. And, and, you know, the, the, the specular highlights on the fence didn't jump out to me as an issue. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, it, 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 it seemed to be okay. So, um, didn't spend too much time on trying to problem solve that. So you're working with fun. Who's a well-known band. Yeah. And you tell them, I want you on the other side of the chain link and I'm going to shoot you through the chain link. Now, there's obviously a couple of logistical issues there, right? You don't want chain link intersecting a face or something like that. Right. But you did a couple interesting things here, composition wise. Um, first of all, the this the the band members trail off from high to low as though they are mimicking the depth of field or, or distance of the fence, right? intentional where you positioned them oh for sure so they um they had just come, gotten off uh off stage and they had a huge huge crowd that day and um the crowd were real they were really into it it was kind of it was right when they were getting really popular so um they had a huge turnout and they were clearly having fun on stage no pun intended i was going to um, say same thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard to yeah um, but so they were amped up. This was literally like two minutes after they walked off stage. So they were, they were so excited. They could care less what I was doing. I tried to give them directions, but they were so hyper and, and they were like wrestling and punching each other and laughing. And, uh, so most of the shots I have of them aren't, aren't great. Um, and then I just finally had to like yell at them and say, Hey, you guys, I need your attention right now for two seconds. Just give me two seconds. And, uh, and I just kind of posed them, you know, so that, like you said, so the, so the, the, the fence is in front of their face and you can see all of their eyes and, and all that. So it just kind of, it was a real quick, like you hear, you hear, you hear, and everybody look at the lens. And, and, and boom, you know, high to low going back, which exactly. is perspective. So you've got just like the fence going back, you've got the perspective of the band going from big to small with the lead singer in the front. Yeah. Did you, his hands, the fact that they're looking you know, the, the guy in the middle is looking at you. The other guy's looking camera right. And the lead singer's looking camera left. Just random? Or did you say to them, look different directions? No, that was random. I, you know, I like to I like to set them up into the situation. But I find if you give them too much direction, it looks like you gave them too much direction. So, you know, I want them to feel a little bit more natural in the, in the shot. Um, if they do something that's not working, I'll definitely jump in and, and direct them away from that. But for the most part, I want them to, you know, to feel relaxed and natural. So I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm careful about how much I tell them to do. But how did you, without directing them, how did, I mean, like the singer's kind of hunching a little bit. And what's weird mm -hmm. is it's almost like he's hunching to fit in that, that diamond shape. And yet it seems like a natural movement to him as though that was happenstance that his head fit in. Did you, did you not only move down, but did you ask him to, to hunch down? Cause you got all the heads in a clean spot against a dark background. So no, he hunched naturally, but I, I moved the camera. Um, cause they can't tell if they're, you know, if their heads in a clean space or not. So I, I was moving the camera and I was laying on the ground. You can't really tell from, from the perspective, but I was laying on the ground, um, and shoving my lens. My lens was physically up against the fence. Um, it was touching oh. the fence. So when you say close. laying so under, you mean literally laying your cameras next to yeah. the ground or you're kneeling? No, I'm laying on my stomach um, at the very bottom of the fence. Really? So, yeah. Interesting. It's kind of a strange angle knowing that actually. 
Yeah. Uh, the other thing I love about this is standard rules of photography. You've got kind yeah. of a rule of thirds going on where the lead singer's on one and then the background guy's on another one. Like I say, the two back fading out to mimic the fence. Obviously, you shot this on a 5D Mark II. It's not a black and white picture by default. So I'm curious, when you get back to, to your studio and you load these onto your computer, what do you normally do in post? What are you looking for when you cull an image? Well, I'm looking for that, you know, really good moment that's just a little bit different um, than, you know, a standard portrait. I like it to, to, to I like it when they, when there's, when there's just something a little bit quirky, you know, if I can find that in a portrait, that's kind of, I'm, I'm drawn to that. Um, obviously, you know, they, they need to look reasonably good um, too. That's, you know, as a portrait photographer, that's, you know, that's kind of a concern. Um, the lighting, you know, the expression, um, you know, it just all kind of has to come together to, to pick that, you know, to make that, that selection. What would you have done on this one? And, and by the way, two questions, actually. One, what would you have done on this one? And two, why black and white? What do you mean, what would I have done? Done differently? No, what would you have done post-wise? What work would you have done in post on this? Oh, oh, gotcha. Um, not much. You know, I, I'm not a big post guy. So, you know, I have a um, just a, a black and white setting. I use Lightroom uh, primarily. Um, and I, I might have like taken a little bit of litter out of the picture or something, but for the most part, I'm just, I just converted it to black and white, probably, um, crunched the blacks just a little bit to make it a little bit more contrasty. Um, and maybe, uh, up the, um, the shadows just a touch. And, um, and I think I added a little bit of uh, vignette just to kind of keep the eye focused on the band and, and not let it wander out of the frame. You, you say on and your website that you don't rely on gimmicks or the latest software plugins to make successful photographs. And I love that quote. So do you ever use plugins or it's literally banned from your computer? I don't have any plugins. I don't, I, I it's, you know, I, I came, I actually came to digital, you know, hesitantly. <laughs> I still love to shoot film and, and, you know, my, my passion in photography is making pictures. It's not, sitting in front of a computer and, and clicking buttons that, I mean, in fact, the last thing I like to do with my pictures is really, um, is look at them on the computer. I, I, you'll find me in the dark room for, um, for days before you'll find me in front of the computer for days. So, um, so now it just, it doesn't appeal to me. You know, I liked, I'm, uh, I'm a pretty technical guy when it comes to photography. So, um, I, I really enjoy getting it right in the camera, you know? Um, I mean, I do, I, I, I'm not saying I don't use Photoshop and I don't manipulate because I do. I ju it's just not, um, it's not what excites me about the medium. Well, so, and one of the things like you said challenge. was you may have removed some trash from this, which is a key distinction because, you know, I shoot concerts as well and yeah. I try not to remove anything unless if I'm shooting for a venue or I'm shooting for a yeah. band, then yes, because that's a marketing picture. As opposed right. to if I'm shooting for a media publication, now it's photojournalism and I don't remove right. anything, but clearly you're shooting marketing pictures for either the band or the venue that yeah. you're shooting for. What made you choose to, to go more towards the black and white sepia type look on this? It was more dramatic, more dramatic. The color, um, the color just wasn't as um, impactful. You know, it was more graphic. It's, a, it's kind of a graphic type image. And when I'm choosing between color and black and white, um, you know, in my mind, anyway, a black and white image um, is more successful if it's more if it's more of a graphic type of image and a color image is more successful in color if if the colors are really strong. So in this particular picture, the colors weren't super strong. It was it wasn't a super sunny day in San Francisco, you know, so it was kind of foggy. So there wasn't a lot of color in the sky. The grass there is dead. Um, and those trees had some green in them, but not enough to make it really an exciting, colorful picture. Right. So. Um, but the graphic elements of the fence and the perspective and, um, you know, the, the way it's framed um, just really kind of said, hey, this needs to be in black and white. You you sent me some outtakes from this session. And yeah. I kind of just want to run through these really quick. You know, when you look at the 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 shot that you ended up with compared to ones where they're leaning back or their heads are too close to the fence there's, there's one of the outtake images where they're like hugging each other. Like you say, they're wrestling. But what I love about that one, where where the, the guy in the jacket's in the middle and the lead singer has this infectious smile on his face, yeah. you could very, very easily 
use that image um, except for the, the bar through his head, but I don't even mind that. There's this infectious energy in that shot. Um, yeah. Then there's one where they're they're clearly kind of like positioning themselves and one where all three of them are laughing really, really big. And then yeah. you end up with the one that you choose, which kind of brings all of those emotions plus a seriousness in with it. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. I could see this easily cropped square as an album cover. Mm. which is for music pictures. A lot of times what I think about is, could you put this on an album cover or, or print it right. behind the desk in a record company uh, behind the receptionist on the wall? And this one you definitely could. Right. So beautiful work, man. I absolutely love what you do. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. People need to go look at your work aside from this, because again, you also do landscapes. You do a lot of portraits that aren't music, which is why I'm hesitant to say that you're a music photographer because you really do so many different things. What is your website? It's just my last name, www.sanseri.com, S-A-N-S-E-R-I. Okay. You're also obviously on Facebook. Yep. Just, uh, if you search Josh Sanseri photography, it should pop right up. Okay. And, uh, I follow you as well on Instagram, which is just Jay Sanseri. Uh, yeah. Definitely go check him out there. And of course, again, you help pick the student for the first episode I'm going to do with the the Red River Paper educational program. That's going to happen on my next episode. So to the audience, make sure that you pay attention for that. We've got Carl Eric Voslog coming in and a fantastic reflection image from Norway. And just to add something in, it's even got Noah's Ark in there. Uh, which will make it really, really. In I, actually, I don't know. Did I show you what image we picked for him? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's so. a beautiful reflection image, slightly yeah. long exposure, and tons of stuff to talk about in that image. So I'm looking forward to that. And to Josh again, I know what you've been through with the fires. I mean, actually, I can't know what you've been through with the fires, but I have kind of an idea. The main thing is I'm glad that you're back home. I'm glad that you're safe. And I appreciate of all the hectic time that you took time to do this. My pleasure. Thank you for uh, your patience. I know we had to reschedule once or twice, but uh, thank you so much for, for having me. And, uh, and I really enjoyed it. Well, uh, hopefully I'll get you back on again sometime because you've got, you got a lot of different work that we can get to. And to everybody, make sure that you check him out. Sanseri.com is where you can go find him. Uh, make sure that you follow me wherever you want. You can find me at uh, my website. Uh, the easiest way to do that is just head to stevebrazel.com. Same as the country Brazil, but two L's. Or the website for this podcast is behindtheshot.tv. On Instagram and Twitter, it's just at Steve Brazel. And then, of course, if you head on over to Facebook, it's Steve Brazel Photography is the best place to find me there. So again, thank you for stopping by. Make sure you check out the website, behindtheshot.tv. Subscribe to the podcast there. And one last request for you. If you do subscribe to the podcast in iTunes or wherever, please make sure and drop us both a rating and a review because it does help with discoverability. Make sure you don't get the old podcast on the old network. The new one, there's two feeds, audio and video and it will list my name, Steve Brazel. That does it for this episode of Behind the Shot, where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots. We'll see you next time. Hey.